Annyeonghaseyo. My name is Dr. Ryo Tanishino. I'm a lecturer in history in the School of Social Sciences in Fale, USP. I've been teaching at USP since July 2012. As well as teaching courses, uh, supervising postgraduate students' research and uh, working on my research projects, uh, one of the things I do at USP is to run a program called Academy of Korean Studies. Uh, this program uh, introduces people and students to um, what Korea is about. And uh, one of the major events I organize is to uh, take students on trips to Korea. What are you excited about, Kevita? I'm just excited for one thing, and that is to like, touch and feel the snow. <laughs> okay. Hi, Lino. What are you excited to see in Korea? Uh, my friend. Kushbu. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. What are you excited to see? Well, the snow idea terrifies me, but I'm looking forward to that as well. <laughs> My name is Kushbu and um, I was one of the five uh, who got selected for this Korea trip. I'll just say it outright, the people there are beautiful and um, by that I mean they really know how to take care of how they look. It's no wonder that uh, Korea is the largest in the beauty industry. So be it old or young, they really know how to groom themselves and take care of their appearances. Other than that, let's just not talk about how they look, but there were many other aspects. For example, um, when we used to travel from one place to the other, we used to use either the subway or the buses. and. Um, Koreans who would be traveling on the buses or subways, they don't exactly talk to each other. Even friends sitting next to each other, they don't really talk to each other. And we being the bunch that got from here, we were very chatty and probably the noisiest bunch on, uh, on that area. 
in that area. So uh, what I noticed most about that group is that they're mostly on their smartphones and since they have Wi-Fi almost everywhere, it's easier for them. They are definitely the head down generation. Uh, we had the chance of uh, knowing a few Koreans, our brilliant tour guide Max, his gorgeous wife um, and uh, our very humble uh, host at the accommodation. So getting to know them personally and um, spending a few time with them, I found out that Koreans are very much cultured people and it shows in their way of life, say for example the way they very neatly arrange their shoes outside their doorsteps before entering their homes or even some restaurants. They don't wear shoes inside the restaurants. Also, uh, the way they uh, almost bow down 90 degrees when they say thank you or hello, it's very pleasing and refreshing. Our entire trip we were based at the accommodation called Bunk, the guest house, and our host Mr. Kim. So the girls were given one room and the boys were given the other and uh, all our facilities were separate. So on that day, uh, our washroom, the girls' washroom got clogged on and uh, early in the morning, you gotta do what you gotta do. Uh, the guys were good enough to let us use their washroom but then I had to go and uh, request our host, uh, Brian, to have a look at our clogged washroom and fix it as soon as possible. So. This gentleman, he went there. I had to warn him that uh, well, there was something you wouldn't want to have a look at early in the morning. It was in a pleasant site. Uh, he went to the washroom and then um, upon reaching there, he goes, hmm, interesting. Now, I thought his response was very different from what any other Fijian would have given, even at my place. You'd probably hear someone swear at that moment, but okay, he goes, hmm, interesting. And then he fixed the problem up. He came to us, he goes, ladies, all good, we are done. And then we said, thank you. And he goes, my pleasure. I, I found his um, reaction and the way he handled the situation very abnormal. Because later on, after, the, uh, after Brian went, the three of us, the ladies, we were laughing about it, thinking how the situation would have been handled anywhere else in the world, or probably back home, and who would have gotten the scolding from the cleaner. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just a fond memory of how positive he handled, how positively he handled the situation, and um, I'd probably remember that for the rest of my life. Hello. Hi everyone, my name is Lionel. <laughs> and I'm Patricia. <laughs> We're two of the five students that visited Korea uh, last December. And we were given the task of speaking about the traditional and Korea and cultural aspect of the trip. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is the food. And the food was really interesting as I mentioned earlier. That's the the one thing that had me culture shock because it was very new like kimchi and bulgogi and all of that but really nice food and I found it economical like most of it was vegetarian and you don't feel overly stuffed when you finish eating it you feel like you can walk for miles even though you've had like a big hit yeah, I try to stay away from fast food because it's something you can get here anyway and try to experience the more traditional types of food so in Korea they use two specific ingredients as gochujang and tenjang and you can really taste it the for example gochujang is chili paste so they use that in bibimbap that's mixed rice and one of my favorite dishes was uh, it's called kebunak it's seafood cooked in soy sauce and they put a lot of cheese on the top so that was my favorite thing everything was new to me so i enjoyed the experience i took on a when in rome attitude so i enjoyed it <laughs> There was, there was one more thing I remembered. Um, whenever you go to a restaurant in Korea, they always have a list of the calorie count for their menu. So they're really concerned about their diet especially. And we did eat a lot on the trip, but we noticed when we came back, we Most didn't gain weight. weight. We actually we lost, lost weight. weight. <laughs> so that's a good thing for anyone that yeah. wants to go to Korea. <laughs> and chopsticks, really have to get used to <laughs> chopsticks. <laughs> 
it was self-taught but really good and good experience. So now I can use basic chopsticks. <laughs> yes. For me personally, I think uh, what I took was the architecture. There were a few places that we went specifically like uh, the Gyeongbokgung Palace and the Bukchon village next to it where it displayed architecture or houses that were built with a style from the 1800s to 1700s and that was something that we could compare automatically with the high-rise buildings that were there. When we were standing at one point in the Bukchon village, we took a, a group photo. We were, we were surrounded by these traditional architectures, but in the back you have these skylines and these, these big buildings. So you, can have, you see the contrast straight away. And that's something that we were talking about, how Korea is trying to maintain that balance. Um, what were you think? You know, with the traditional, you can see how intricate the details are in architecture, just relating to architecture. But we also went to the folk village and one thing I noticed was the heating system. So every building that you go to, it's the floors that are heated. And when we went to the folk village, we saw that the reason why the older buildings, they have like stone floors is because they build the fires under. So those heating systems, they've perfected it now and it's existed for centuries there. So you think about how old and how developed they are because they really have been working at it for so long. And I think those kind of traditional aspects is what caught my eye. And later we went and tried on the handbook at uh, Max and Jeannie's house, our guide Max. And it, it's really warm, so you think those kind of, it's really well thought out. So imagine wearing it at that time, during winter, the handbook, it's, it's pretty warm. So yeah, it actually keep keeps, the, you yeah, warm. keeps you warm. Yeah, we so. were inside, we were inside the house at that time. <laughs> it was and sweaty. it was warm in there already because they have good heating yeah. system. And then we had to try that on and it was hot. <laughs> but it was a good experience to try the traditional clothes as well. I think the other They're, traditional aspect would be the demeanor, how they hold themselves. Eh? You still have like the hierarchy, respect your elders. You see that on public transportation systems. You see that out on the street, no one's noisy or causing a racket. And that to me is something that's not born overnight. It's probably existed for centuries in their culture. Yeah, so, that, yeah. that level of respect is still there. Like um, for me, especially because I'm part Chinese, we don't see that much in the Chinese culture now. How the young respect the elders, how you always have to bow, and there's a different way of uh, speaking. There's formal and informal, and they still have that in Korea, and it's really strong. No matter how old you are, if you're 40 and you're speaking to someone that's 43, you still have to respect that person just the same. Even when you go shopping, like they'll give you money with both hands on the notes, right? You know, and bow. There's a long line of people who's waiting to buy, but then they'll still do that for every person yeah. that's buying. So from our side as well, we we got to learn that as yeah. well, like how to respect them the same way. So it's it, really it's it's good eye opener for people like us from Fiji. You can still live in a developed country and keep aspects of your culture and tradition. Exactly. Bulevinaka, my name is Raku David Tararo Kulutu and I am a final year student pursuing my degree in the Bachelor's of Art with graduate certificate in education, double majors in geography and history. Bulevinaka, my name is Panina Wangatambu and I'm currently a final year student at the University of the South Pacific. place where we were bumped in, the location of our guest house was at Hongdae. Hongdae is, um, is like a district of universities where young people attended and uh, you know when there's a place where young people will be definitely there'll be a chain of activity going on, it has to be, it's going to be a lively place and that's what we experienced. Uh, the nightlife was really amazing. Um, there'll be people standing by on the side of the roads with their guitar, uh, strumming it away, singing out. Um, this K-pop culture was really alive there. And um, in Hongdae, you can, it's just filled with young people who are attending the universities and the dormitories were close by. And our bunk house was located at Hongdae City. So there was this massive number of young people out there. And we were really excited to see and to mingle with them and see how young people, ordinary young people, Korean, just like us, university students had to live their life, and their life was really, really fun. And uh, during the day, shops would be closed, but at night, because it was winter, and the winter night was just beautiful, romantic, and it was just amazing, yeah. Pivotal moment for me would be the trip to the DMZ or the demilitarization um, area, which is uh, the 38th parallel line. When we arrived there, uh, there was so much military, it was just, um, you can see soldiers with guns. It was something that I saw in movies and I was pretty excited. I remember like peering out from the bus 
and trying to take um, trying to take shots of what was happening on the ground. And I remember I said, this is what I want. This is why I wanted to go to Korea. I want these kind of things. I want this excitement. I want to see. I want to see the realness of a country. So, and apparently we all know about history. What happened to between North Korea and South Korea? That's why I'm passionate about history. And when we studied about it, and actually coming, coming to what we had studied, it's like just an amazing feeling. And there was this place that we can actually look out, like uh, that place is actually called Thirty Eighth Parallel Line. So as we were standing there with the, those binoculars, kind of. Uh, maybe a telescope or something and we could actually look out and see North Korea. We couldn't see people or activities but just that thought of just looking out and imagining in my head what's happening, you know, what uh, what the people must be thinking. And I remember loud music was blaring out from, from where we were standing and I was asking one of the locals, I said, why do you play like English music? Why do you play in really loud? And they said, and then this is his response. The reason why we play loud music is we're trying to get the attention of the people there because their mindset, they've been, they've been under dictatorship rule and they need to know that there's so much freedom and equality over this side. And I remember when I was walking through this, they put like memoirs, like um, little flags and they write letters. They, they even have like um, uh, remnants of the of like the old train, you know, and it was seated there. And I and then they also had pictures, photographs of like uh, uh, mothers and children, you know, like the 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 sadness there. I could feel that there was this deep sadness. There was a gloom feeling there, and I was imagining like what would the parent, you know, the the what would be the parents' reaction or and the you know, like because they are separated. So all those kind of thoughts was coming in my mind. So I, and also when we went, we, we went, uh, we went into one of the tunnels. Like apparently those tunnels that um, the South Koreans they just found out that the North Koreans were trying to get into Seoul. And so um, fortunately they found those caves, those tunnels. So so they use it now for 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 tourist attraction. So what we did was we went, and then it's I was just. I was just thinking to myself how amazing and how hardworking and the unity these people put together, the North Koreans, to try and come up with a tunnel to get to, to South Korea, you know, and, and you can just tell that these people are very hardworking people. And just going in that tunnel and although it was very hard and tiring, but it was an exciting, um, exciting uh, part of the journey for me. So I, I think the DMZ or the demilitarization zone was um, definitely a highlight. Yeah. The relationship between Japan and Korea is uh, very complicated. Um, you may have seen that uh, um, uh, Japan colonized Korea and during the colonial era uh, Japan did uh, many uh, cruel things to the Korean people and um, um, when I was growing up in Japan uh, I grew up uh, without knowing those things and it was only when um, I left Japan for um, my further studies or it was only after uh, I you know I became an adult uh, or maybe later in my high school years that I got to find out about uh, what Japan uh, had done to Korea and I felt I had to do something and uh, you might call it colonial guilt, you might call it post-colonial guilt, uh, you could put whatever tags you may want uh, but uh, I felt um, as somebody who had a normal, if you like normal, upbringing in Japan um, it would seem like um, a serious, serious blemish on the relationship between Japan and Korea without reaching out to the relationship between Japan and Korea. Um, so um, the chance I got from the Academy of Korean Studies to run this project um, is beneficial, doubly beneficial, because A, uh, I am promoting um, 
Korea to the students at USP and B, uh, I am, if you like, educating myself and perhaps um, that self-education uh, may be useful uh, for you in the long run. Um, and it's, uh, it's quite a, um, a, a dynamic relationship. Okay? Uh, I don't know whether you can see this uh, globe here. Um, here's Korea. Yes. Okay. The Korean Peninsula here. And here's Japan. Okay. And uh, just uh, where's Fiji? Fiji is right there. Okay. So uh, if you look at um, this globe, uh, Korea and Japan are very close. But when I was growing up, uh, not such a long time ago, <laughs> um, when, when people told me like the word foreign country, I would think about places like the United States, I would think about places like Europe, I would think about places like uh, uh, I don't know, Australia or New Zealand. I wasn't thinking about Korea. So the, the geogra geographical distance between uh, Japan and Korea uh, may not be that long but there's an emotional or uh, psychological um, distance between two countries and I thought to myself how, how come how come I've got this weird distance and I wanted to get closer okay. and it's very ironic because I came all the way from Japan to, to Fiji uh, <laughs> But then again, I'm, um, you know, um, uh, trying to promote uh, Korea to the students here. Uh, but um, uh, when we went to Fiji's embassy, embassy in Korea, the ambassador and first secretary there uh, wanted to say to me that um, um, their mission is to uh, promote uh, Korea sorry, uh, Fiji to the people in Korea and um, so um, uh, I mean I suppose um, uh, whatever they try to do sort of matches up with uh, what I'm trying to do here okay I had several criteria um, for student selection uh, one is um, the GPA um, I wanted to have students with very good GPAs. Um, so I think I asked for something like um, three out of four, uh, or something like that. Uh, so high GPA, strong GPA was perhaps the most important thing. And um, uh, and then uh, I asked students to write uh, a short essay. Uh, telling us why they wanted to go to Korea. Um, I saw many applications that uh, really said something like, oh, I want to go to Korea because I want to go abroad. Uh, okay, um, that kind of essay didn't really impress me um, because uh, it really showed that it didn't really matter where they're going, so long as they're going somewhere. <laughs> okay, uh, but uh, what I wanted to see from the applicants was that uh, they wanted to go to Korea because they wanted to go to Korea. Uh, I wanted to see that uh, they had uh, done a bit of homework about uh, what Korea is, or what Korea was like, what they know what Korea is, and uh, how the trip would uh, broaden their horizon and deepen the appreciation of Korea. And then um, uh, third uh, and the last of the uh, criteria um, is the interview. Um, I think I, uh, well, with the help of my assistants, um, we shortlisted uh, about 25, 27 or 8 applicants down to about uh, eight um, we were going to pick five so I picked about eight uh, well, together with the assistance of um, some of my uh, uh, assistants um, and then um, interview really showed 
um, who the students were, uh, what they were like uh, in person, and um, uh, I, I think I asked some questions about um, what they know about Korea, how they want to benefit from their trips to Korea, and um, how they would respond to several cases of emergency, uh, which could happen. Uh, fortunately, nothing happened. Uh, but um, um, I wanted to see if the students were uh, prepared enough to answer those questions. Uh, why? Because um, if the students were serious about going to Korea, um, then it probably would be good if the students had done some kind of homework. Um, so there were some students who uh, didn't really do much homework and uh, those students uh, didn't get a note from me. Uh, but um, um, what I wanted to see from the students was that they, they really, really, really wanted to go to Korea. That they really, really wanted to learn something from Korea from the street. So, um, uh, so if I put it in a different way, um, I had cases where students wrote good essays or good uh, yeah, compositions, and, but they didn't really do a good job in the, in the interview, whereas I had a few cases where students did, wrote so-so essays, but um, they really did a good interview to, uh, if you like, uh, recover some of the ground. So, um, yeah, um, so GPA, uh, interview and then composition and behind all that uh, I wanted to see whether the students' motivation was genuine and that they had um, uh, done some research about this trip and about the country. Okay.